on this edition of It's a Miracle. When a young man's car gets stuck in the snow, he has no choice but to brave the sub-zero temperatures to search for help. But his journey through the woods attracts the attention of a dangerous predator. When I glimpsed over my shoulder and I thought I'd seen something, but I wasn't sure. It was dark and I couldn't just tell if there was anything there or not. Soon, exposure to the freezing cold makes it impossible for him to continue on as the creature closes in. When a child's most cherished possession is lost, her world is turned upside down. I've actually never seen a child that upset, where she was totally inconsolable. And with the loss of Blackie, she became a, a bit of a shell of herself. And then, days later and miles away in another city, her sadness turns to joy. Follow the footsteps of a homeless man whose life is about to take an unexpected and dramatic turn. Dad! Dad! I was walking out of an alley, and there was my daughter. I don't know how to explain it. Dad. I think I was the last person in the world he expected to see. Dad. On this edition of It's a Miracle. Oh, it's a miracle. And now, from PAX TV Studio 611, your host, Richard Thomas. Good evening, and welcome to It's a Miracle. Tonight's show features several miraculous rescues. In each case, a human life is at risk. But just when all hope is lost, something intervenes on their behalf. I say something because the saving grace isn't always another human being. In fact, our first story brings us a most unlikely angel, a wild and savage predator that would just as soon kill a man as save him. Happy New Year! Happy New Year, everybody. On January 2nd, 1996, 21-year-old Carter Allen and his girlfriend Dawn left a New Year's party at a local cafe to make the short drive to his parents' home. It's freezing out here. When we left Walker, Minnesota to make the last 10 miles to my parents' house, the weather temperature was probably about 30 below with a windshield of a minus 70. What they didn't realize was that the roads ahead were covered with ice and drifting snow, and that their decision to leave the safety of the cafe was about to endanger their lives. So icy, Carter. How much further is it? Another three miles. Doing fine. It's way too icy. As they turned onto a side road leading to his parents' home, the car hit a patch of ice and in the next instant veered off the road, landing in a ditch. Don, are you okay? Don? Don, are you okay? okay. Alright. The car was still running and we were stuck. I tried to go forward, I tried to go backwards. And we were just weren't moving. And I immediately just thought of what I'm gonna have to do to make it out of here. Oh, what are we gonna do? We're gonna, have, we're gonna have to dig. We gotta get out, we gotta dig, we gotta get some traction. Okay. I got outside and, and I kept on shoveling the snow away from the tires. And every time I would do that, the snow would just come right back down on the tires. So I just kept on trying and that was going nowhere. This is work. The freezing cold left them no option but to get back inside the car. Even there, it would be difficult to escape the minus 70 degree wind chill. Their only hope was to get the engine running. But it too was frozen and refused to start. We're stuck. We're stuck, Carter. Oh, look, there was a, do you remember that house we passed about a half a mile back? Yeah, I thought I saw a light. Okay, all right, we're gonna have to try and make it to that house. Oh. 
Are you okay? You okay? It's too cold, Carter. I can't do this. It's just right up there. Are you sure? I can't. It's too cold. Okay. Dawn was already too weak from exposure to the cold. Stay here. And so Carter helped her back into the relative safety of the vehicle. All right. Stay yeah. here. I'm going to go for help, okay? Stay here. And struck out on his own. Took off running. And uh, I ran almost all the way. But when Carter finally arrived at the cabin, he was in for a bitter disappointment. Please, please. Oh, oh. I'm so sorry to bother you, sir, but our car broke down and we're stuck in the snow. Can you help us? Please. He was pretty much not going to help me that night. I told him there was somebody else in the vehicle back there. The car was stalled and there's a blizzard out here and it's pretty bad please condition. He still pretty much wasn't gonna help me. Sorry. Please. No phone, no car. No, 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 here. no please. No. no. When I left his house, I was angry inside, but I, I knew that I couldn't just sit there and be mad, you know, get mad. Just stand in the middle of nowhere, argue, holler, scream, whatever. I knew that I had to use all my energy to get back to the car. But Carter's presence in the forest had attracted the attention of another creature. From deep within the woods, he'd acquired a shadow, a shadow of something that watches and waits. The conclusion when it's a miracle returns. While driving to his parents' home outside Walker, Minnesota, Carter Allen lost control of his car and ended up hopelessly stuck in a ditch. With temperatures well below freezing and a wind chill factor of negative 70, Carter set off on his own to get help. But the owner of the nearest cabin no phone, turned him away. No now, weak from exposure, Carter attempted to return to his car. But he wasn't returning alone. He was being closely shadowed by a wolf. When I glimpsed over my shoulder and I thought I seen something, but I wasn't sure because of the snow and it was dark and I couldn't just tell if there was anything there or not. Carter didn't wait to find out what was following him. He had to get back to the car and he was beginning to feel the full effects of the cold. I couldn't feel my hands no more. My arms were getting really cold. My feet I couldn't feel. My pants legs were full of ice. And what made me stop and collapse was I couldn't breathe anymore. No Barely conscious, Carter's life was in grave danger. If he remained in the snow, he would certainly die of exposure. And even now, the shadow that had been following him was closing in. I realized it was a... Uh a wolf, and just came right up to me. It didn't show any aggressiveness or nothing like that, so I figured I'm, I'm not gonna be aggressive to a wolf. I called him sort of like a dog. Okay, okay. I just, I grabbed it, I hugged it, and then I put my face right about where his neck was. I breathed right into his fur. Thank you. The warmth of the animal's body revived Carter enough to continue on. I got up and took off running again. And I ran probably 10 feet. And I turned back around and I looked and it was, it must have took off running in the woods, it was gone. When I got to the back of the car, I was really happy because I knew that there was shelter. I could get in there out of the snow, out of the wind, and I was happy to see Don was still in the vehicle. The next morning, a passing tow truck driver spotted the car and transported the two cold and tired young people to Carter's mother, Cheryl Allen's home. Cheryl Allen's place. Carter and Don, they came in the front door early in the morning. They looked cold. I 
put them on the couch, I wrapped them in blankets, I made some hot coffee, and I told them to drink something hot to warm up, and they were very cold. When Carter told his mother about the incredible events that had transpired that night, she was immediately struck by the significance that wolves play in their Native American heritage. It's been said that the wolf walked with man before we were friends with him and companions. And now, to hear that a wolf saved my son's life seemed natural. It's a natural part of our culture. When I look back on that night, I believe that was a miracle. Being me in a life and death situation. Thank you. And then a wolf appearing, helping me through it. And then me and Don both making it through. I believe that was a miracle in itself. Carter Allen and his family are currently active in Minnesota with organizations that protect the natural habitat of the wolf. We'll be right back. Coming up, when a homeless man turns to social services for help, he gets more than he ever bargained for. May I see your ID, please? I'm sorry, man, I don't have any. Nothing with your name on it? Because I did not have ID at this point in time, I said, oh, okay, well, you can call my, call my mother. That telephone call would bring him a message that would change his life forever. Your mother wants to speak with you. Hello, Mama. A stuffed black cat becomes a young girl's security blanket that she takes with her everywhere she goes. A lot of times people would see Blackie as sort of a moth-eaten, ratty old cat. But Blackie had very special meaning to a very special girl. So when the cat is suddenly lost, the young child organizes a memorial service in its honor. Oftentimes during the service, she would look up and, and talk to God. God, can you please bring Blackie back to me because I really miss him. I hope a child's prayer is answered when It's a Miracle returns. Sometimes, as adults, we tend to forget how miraculous the world can seem from a child's point of view. And our next story is a perfect example. It concerns a child's devastating loss and the series of events that transform that loss into a miracle. I think you'll have to agree, no matter what your age, that there's really no explanation for what happened, except, perhaps, that a child's prayer was answered. In 1991, Sanjay and Jamie Anand took their twin daughters, Diva and Tasha, out shopping for a stuffed animal. Tasha chose a dog, and Diva picked a cat and named him Blackie. The two quickly became inseparable. For small children, it's very important that they have a um, object of affection that always is reliable, is always there. And after that, the hare never laughed at the tortoise again. Good night, Diva. Blackie was that object of affection. She could give love to Blackie, and Blackie gave unconditional love back to her. Wherever Diva went, Blackie was right there by her side, including trips as far away as Europe and Asia. People would say, how many people would you have in your family? And then since we have five, I'd like say six, counting Blackie like as like a person in the family. So this looks good. And like a member of the family, Blackie was always present at mealtimes. Blackie was a special spirit and soul to her. And oftentimes at the dinner table, you would see her eating, and she would sort of offer a little bit to Blackie and then bring it back up to herself. Hurry up. He even followed her to school each day, until Diva's teachers asked her to leave him at home. Even then, he would ride to school with her and wait in the car for her return. Obviously, over the years, Blackie's love was well-worn. Blackie's fur began to wear thin. We had to have a couple of opportunities for what we used to call around our house Blackie surgeries. In fact, I would get Diva and tell her never to put a Blackie in the wash because dirt is the only thing holding Blackie together. <laughs> 
A lot of times people would see Blackie as sort of a moth-eaten, ratty old cat, but Blackie had very special meaning to a very special girl. And then one day, while on a field trip to a local ice skating rink, their special relationship came to an end. At one point, one of the directors saw that she was holding a stuffed cat under her arm, and she felt that it was a safety hazard. I don't think you should have black and nuts with you because you might drop them and somebody might trip and get hurt. So why don't you let me put them on the bus and you can get them after you're done skating, okay? All right. All right, okay, have fun. Okay. So I just gave it to her because I was having fun skating with my friends, but I was still sort of sad that I had to leave Blackie in the bus. So when I later came by to pick up Diva, she was very upset. The bus had left before she could get Blackie back. Jamie wasn't able to track down the right bus until the following morning. By then, the stuffed animal was nowhere to be found. Okay, thank you. Okay, bye bye. Diva waited, praying that her most cherished possession would be returned. I'm so sorry, Diva, but they couldn't. <laughs> but it find wasn't meant to be. I know, I know. Diva was very upset. But I want Blackie. I know you want Blackie, dear. <laughs> I've actually never seen a child that upset, where she was totally inconsolable. And with the loss of Blackie, she became a, a bit of a shell of herself. She would cry, not overtly a lot of times, but sort of quietly. I'm glad that all of you could make it here and all you animals too. She decided that she would have a funeral for Blackie. And she got together all of her stuffed animals and Diva was the voice of each of the little stuffed animals. Now this is Milky, and she's gonna say something to Blackie's mom. Well, I miss Blackie a lot too, and I hope he comes back as well. Oftentimes during the service, she would look up and, and talk to God. God, can you please bring Blackie back to me because I really miss him. I hope wherever he is right now, he's comfortable and he's happy. It, it was very touching. And then, three days after Diva's prayer, the family decided to spend the day at the Wild Rivers Water Park in the nearby city of Irvine, hoping to improve Diva's spirits. Diva was really upbeat, and her mind seemed to be totally off of Blackie, and she was really enjoying what she was doing, and it really made us very happy. The girls were having fun playing on the various water rides, not knowing that a small miracle is about to occur. <laughs> we went on this ride and after we got off the ride, we were walking down and just talking and I happened to look to my left and I saw something that sort of seemed like Blackie to me. Tasha, does that look like Blackie? And he thought that maybe it could be Blackie because it looked like a cat with a pointy ears and had some patches that were kind of like Blackie's patches. Oh my gosh, it is Blackie, it's Blackie. It's Blackie. Oh there was this God. sudden burst of joy Blackie. on her face. Oh my gosh, she thought it never like, oh, it is Blackie. It is Blackie. It was really wet and dirty, but sure enough, it was Blackie. It had to be Blackie because there was like no other cat that could have the same patches. And we were all overjoyed and jumping up and down. And later on, when I started thinking about it, it was amazing. How could Blackie end up there? Oh, it's, it's a miracle. I know, my God. I felt, like, so happy that I thought, like, God was, like, listening to me and everything. Like, when I asked him, please bring Blackie back and stuff. Now she always, like, makes sure that wherever she goes, she knows where Blackie is so that he won't get lost again. But I guess after that, it drew kind of a closer bond between her and Blackie and Diva realized that Blackie was a special cat or a gift from God. The fact that Blackie was found in a different city, in a large amusement park, that we would happen to see Blackie at that particular moment, the odds are unbelievable that you would have this type of connection with a particular item. It really, truly gives you an awe-inspiring thought that there is a greater spiritual being that sees the hurt and the pain of children and returns these things to those children. Please stay with us for more right after this. Coming up. 
the story of a successful businessman's fall from grace as his addiction to crack cocaine destroys his life and takes away everything meaningful in it. The district attorney asked that I be given eight years in the penitentiary. That's when I remembered something that my mother used to do all the time, and, and my mother would pray. His prayers would be answered in a most amazing way when It's a Miracle continues. And now, once again, Richard Thomas. If you live in a major urban area, you're probably familiar with the plight of the homeless. You find them sleeping in doorways and begging for spare change on street corners. And perhaps you've wondered what happened to bring someone that low. Well, tonight, we're going to answer that question, at least in the case of one man, Izell Williams. Izell's story is timely, terrifying, and might have been tragic if it weren't for a miraculous rescue. It was 1992, and Azell Williams was at the lowest point in his life. Addicted to crack cocaine, he was homeless, living on the streets of downtown Los Angeles. He had no family, no job, and no hope. It hadn't always been this way for Azell. He'd been an Air Force veteran and had a successful job on Park Avenue when he moved with his wife from New York to Los Angeles in 1967. I had never been to Los Angeles before, so we actually started out here from ground zero, I mean, not knowing anyone. Two years later, he became the proud father of a baby girl named Dawn. It was wonderful and also scary at the same time because I didn't know uh, the first thing about being a father. I was not really settled into a career or a profession. I was not happy with myself as a person. In 1973, that's when my wife and I got divorced. That was the time that I started getting heavily involved in drugs. Despite his drug problems, Izell managed to work himself up the corporate ladder. And by 1990, he was a successful account executive working on the 48th floor of a downtown high-rise. Yet all the while, his drug habit was getting worse. By 1992, he was cruising the worst areas of Los Angeles, looking for his next fix. I was probably smoking a minimum of $200 a day worth of crack. What you got for me, sweet man? I got the stuff, man. And so I'd just drive up and buy $10 or buy $20. Later. And I would sit in the car and smoke the crack cocaine and then go back to work. And then a few minutes later, I was leaving again, going back to buy more. Eventually, Azell stopped paying his bills. I didn't pay anything, but I paid the dope dealer. That's the only person I paid. That's the only person that I was responsible to and regular, you know, I mean, he got his. All of a sudden, I'm now living in one of these little motels down there because now I've lost the house, I've lost the car, my grooming, everything had started going down. His drug use took a toll on his professional life as well. I couldn't function because I couldn't separate reality from fantasy. And I remember sitting at my desk and I saw bodies flying past the window. I mean, they were just hovering. Another apostle just went by. And I was just like looking and saying, oh, oh uh, it's time for me to go. Come in. Hi, Zell. Do you have a moment? Sure, come on in. Have a seat. 
No, thanks a lot. Look, I've got something to tell you. I can no longer stay here and be productive for you. I've got to go. My boss did not want me to leave, but at the same time, they didn't want me to stay in the condition that I was in. There's always a place here for you. Good luck, Azel. Thank you. Without any income, Azel did whatever was necessary to support his drug habit. The suits, my wardrobe, were sold. They had been converted into monies that had been converted into drugs. Totally destitute, Azel was forced to leave his hotel and live on the streets. He moved into a homeless encampment in an alley, sleeping beneath a makeshift tent. I didn't know how I was going to survive on the streets. Then I'll go get us some breakfast. I talked for a living, so the most logical area for me to go into was panhandling. You're pretty lady. You got any extra change today? I don't have any change, babe. Okay, I used to panhandle in front of the place where I actually used to go to have lunch. And I would have conversations with several of the customers that were regulars there. People don't really look at you. Sir, do you got an extra change? They don't realize that that same person that I asked for money was the same person that I was sitting next to having lunch with, like, maybe a month prior to this. Hope it never happens to you. Azel had hit rock bottom, but a miraculous twist of fate would soon give him a second chance. Hey, folks, you got any extra change? The conclusion, Sir, when it's a miracle, continues. Azel Williams was once a successful businessman with a wife and daughter. But his addiction to crack cocaine cost him his job, his family, and left him homeless on the streets of L.A. And then, after years of living in squalor, begging for spare change and being ignored and rejected by most of humanity, a familiar face miraculously appeared to him out of the crowd. Dad! All we gotta do is go Dad! down there. I was walking out of an alley, and there was my daughter. I don't know how to explain it. Um, I looked across the street. Dad! I just remember screaming, Dad, and went across the street before the signal had even turned. Dad! I think I was the last person in the world he expected to see. Don, baby, what are you doing here? It was just shock, because it had been a while since I had even seen her. I saw a young lady that had grown into being a beautiful woman that I was immensely proud of. Dad, you look terrible. It was very heartbreaking to see someone that you have a love for in a situation like that. My first instinct was to hug him. I was really kind of reluctant to hug her, not because I didn't want to hug her, but because I felt so dirty so unclean and so unworthy of, of touching her. But we did hug. Dad, what would it take for you to leave? I don't know, honey. Dad, if, if Nana wanted you to come home, would you go? Nana? So. My daughter literally packed me up and sent me to my mother. Three months later, Azel's drug addiction brought him back to the streets of LA. But a series of dramatic events was about to change his destiny. I got arrested for possession of cocaine with intent to sell. The district attorney asked that I be given eight years and the penitentiary. That's when I remembered something that my mother used to do Jesus. all the time. And, and my mother would pray. What did I do? So I did 64 days in jail, and then I was released. Azel vowed he would never do drugs again. 
and on October 5, 1995, he applied for welfare. Okay, all your paperwork seems to be in... The caseworker said, well, we need to verify that you're Ezell Williams. May I see your ID, please? Sorry, man, I don't have any. Nothing with your name on it? Because I did not have ID at this point in time, and I said, oh, okay, well, and call my call my mother. Good morning, ma'am. Speak to Mrs. Bertha Williams. As the caseworker began verifying the information over the phone, his L's mother asked to speak to her son. Hold on a moment. Your mother wants to speak with you. Hello, Mama. She said to me, I'm glad to know that you're all right, but I have some bad news for you. Two months after you left, your brother died, and we didn't have any way of getting in touch with you. I love you, too. Everything was waiting for me. It was approved and everything. And I just got up and I walked out. OK, that'll be all. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Mr. Williams, would you sign? Mr. Williams. Azelle began to walk aimlessly for miles and miles. I just started crying as I'm walking. <laughs> I don't remember crossing streets. I don't remember traffic lights. I didn't even know about this part of town. And there were a bunch of people standing around. And I said, what's going on in here? I said, oh, they're, they're getting ready to serve lunch. And I said, well, can anybody go in there for lunch? So I walked into Los Angeles Mission. And the building was like really clean, and it smelled nice. And, and people were smiling, and they were laughing. And, and the food was good on top of that. Ezell was accepted into the mission's rehabilitation program and for the next 17 months worked to rebuild his dignity. And once again, his past caught up with his present. As soon as I graduated, the company that I had worked for back in 1992, they were right there giving me the keys to the office back. And I said, boy, God is good. In July of 1999, Izell left his job as an account executive to start working full time for the Los Angeles Mission in their development department. He occasionally stops where he once lived to let others know that they too can find hope at the mission. To the people out there that think that they're indestructible, look at me because I'm, I'm the mirror. It can happen, but also there is a way out. I think it was a miracle that my father ended up at the LA Mission, and it's nice that he's able to give back to the people that helped him. My entire life has been restored to me, and I thank God that he saw fit that I was worthy of saving my life. Since his recovery, Azel has formed a loving relationship with his daughter Dawn. He often spends time with her and her family, especially his two grandchildren. When I look at my grandchildren, that's the miracle, that I'm still here and I have an opportunity to be in their life. That's a miracle. Of all the amazing things that have happened in his life, for Azell Williams, it's family that's the most important. We wanted to meet them all together, and so they're joining us now. Hey, everybody, welcome to It's a Miracle. Hi, Hi Richard. Azell, I can see why you're such a proud grandfather. Dawn, would you like to introduce your children? Uh, this is Kira, and this is Cameron with the pen. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what's remarkable to me about this story is not just that you managed to find your father on Skid Row, but that the rescue mission could turn his life around and bring him back to you. Um, yeah, it's truly remarkable that there are places like this for people to go. Um, it's really helped our family um, quite a bit. It was a miracle that we found each other, so <laughs> it worked for us. And Azelle, how are you doing now that you're back at the mission in a very different capacity? 
Um, actually, the I'm doing quite well at the mission. I enjoy being here. Um, the work is real rewarding. I think it's for uh, the cause is also uh, something that I am definitely in favor of. Um, and all in all, I don't think that I have been, I can't remember a time in my life when I've been happier than I am right now. Well, I want to wish you both continued happiness and thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you, Richard. For having us. Thank you. We'll be right back. Coming up. A freak accident leaves a young surfer paralyzed from the neck down. I found myself face down in the water, unable to move, and I was totally conscious. I just remember thinking, please, somebody see me, come roll me over. That's next, when It's a Miracle continues. It's impossible to predict when tragedy will strike, and there's no way to prepare yourself for when it does. But sometimes, special circumstances come into play that can rescue a victim from the grip of death. And when that happens, it's often called a miracle. On June 10th, 1995, 23-year-old Chris McLear was a beach bum with no ambitions or goals other than catching the next perfect wave. I thought I was going to be surfing, skating, and snowboarding my whole life. But that summer, Chris's life would change forever. On June 10th, as he headed for the water at Newport Beach, California, Chris could tell that conditions were not perfect. It was really low tide that day. I remember seeing the low tide and thinking, you know, I must be careful because there will be sandbars popping up out of nowhere in the water. Chris was an experienced surfer, and so, ignoring his initial misgivings, he headed into the water. I was on a lawnmower that day, so catching waves was not very difficult at all. After several successful runs, Chris had all but forgotten the danger that lay beneath the surface, a solid sandbar less than a foot below. And then, on a wave no different from any other, the unimaginable occurred. I got pitched on my head and I felt the click. And my body just felt like a funny bone, just numb, like God turned the switch off the back of my neck. I found myself face down in the water, unable to move, and I was totally conscious. I just remember thinking, please, somebody see me, come roll me over. On shore, it was almost impossible to see what had happened. But Chris's longboard caught the attention of a young man. And in a bizarre twist of fate, former lifeguard Rob Stewart noticed his concern. I saw a gentleman in front of me stand up, real alarmed-like. He got up. Looked down at his wife, spun around, and just seemed real uptight about something. And then he sat down again. Just about 15 seconds later, bolted out of his seat again and started to uh, head down towards the water. I knew there was something wrong out there. I ran up to that man and said, What do you got, man? You see that out there, man? And he said that he thought he had seen a body out there. We okay. gotta go. Oh, that's it. The two men wasted no time in racing toward the lifeless body. Upon reaching the body, I knew I had to do one thing first, and that is get some air into the victim. And uh, I could not find a pulse. I needed something to get the victim up above water. Hey, you come over here, please. I kept checking for a pulse. I still just could not find one. And I'm getting very concerned that we're about to have, if we don't already have, a dead body. And then, suddenly, all three men's lives were on the line. We are caught in uh, riptide, taking us out to sea. And I just kept saying to myself, we need help. We need help. Moments later, his prayers were answered. Newport Sea Watch lifeguards had been contacted by someone on shore, and they headed towards the victim from all directions. 
Lifeguard Chris Hill was on the boat. We came onto the scene and we saw a surfer aiding another surfer with the lifeguard. The surfer being aided was lying on his back, on a board, and lifeless, no movement. First thing I did was I assessed that he was not breathing. And uh, whether you have a broken neck, a broken back, or anything, if you're not breathing, you're not going to live very long. Don, I got an airway. Let's go. The lifeguard team rushed Chris back to the pier, where paramedics and an ambulance were waiting. Chris, hold on. Miraculously, by the time he arrived at the hospital, he had regained consciousness. ICU nurse Chris O'Neill explained. He talked about, I'll be OK. I'll be able to move. Um, I had a sense from knowing what his injury was that that may not be true. Chris's neck was broken. He would be paralyzed for the rest of his life. And still, he found the courage to send his fellow surfers a message. I know you surfers out there, so many times when I've surfed Newport 12 feet, huge, and you just hop off your board and hit your head, you know, and you get a little kink, you think nothing of it. Next thing you know, you're, you're just in a foot of water and you get hit the wrong way, and it's over. And it just takes one time not to see it like I did, and here you are. Chris was lucky to be alive. He could just as easily have been left to drown, face down, unable to move his body. Someone was watching over Chris that day. And with the quick thinking and help of some very real guardian angels, his life was saved. Since his accident, another miracle of sorts has happened. While some would see paralysis as a reason for despair, Chris has a completely different attitude. I'm glad that I broke my neck for who knows where my life was going. I believe this happened for a reason. Uh, now I'm doing things. I'm expanding my mind. I'm reading. I'm going to school. I'm educating kids. Good is coming from this. I'm a lot closer with my family, closest relationship I've ever had with my parents. Life has just taken on a whole new meaning for me. And yeah, it's great. Chris's life continues to improve. Recently, he purchased a van equipped with hand controls, which he drives to his numerous speaking engagements, and he plans to return to school in the near future. We wish him the best of luck. We'll be right back. That's our show for this evening. Thank you for joining us. And a special thanks to all the people who shared their remarkable stories tonight on It's a Miracle. It's our hope that whenever you need one, you'll find a miracle in your life, too. Until next time, I'm Richard Thomas. Good night. <laughs>